Liz has been playing preludes on a small electronic piano. <laughs> it's about 30 years old out in the gazebo when we've had outside worship. And <clears throat> I almost offered her the opportunity to continue to play that this morning. <laughs> I'm sad. But it's uh, her preludes are so soothing and meditative that I almost forget I have something to say. So um, thank you, Liz. We want to welcome you to worship at First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Paris, Kentucky, uh, worshiping virtually due to the pandemic. We had 10 straight Sundays of beautiful dry weather. Um, however, this Sunday, the rains came and drove us inside, um, but yet we've not determined that we're going to worship as a whole congregation inside. So we have our worship team here, and I thank them for coming. But I have proof this morning that uh, God has a sense of humor. We have bragged and bragged and bragged about how many Sundays we had gone without rain for our service. And uh, of course it poured all night long and it was raining on the way to the church and I pulled up in the parking lot and it quit raining. <laughs> and then it started again. So um, God was, well anyway, God had an opinion. Today we want to thank uh, Ashley Norris for bringing our invocation, Vicki Myers for being the lead voice for our music, Liz Yeiser for playing the piano, Tyler Gonzalez for reading scripture, Bro Lovell and uh, Judy Otti for presiding at the table, Leanne Frank for bringing the invocation, or the benediction. Reverend Sharon Fields will be bringing our message and Sharon's a member here at First Christian Church, but also is the pastor of Carlisle Christian Church. They have not uh, return to meeting yet. Most recently, she was the chairperson of the board for the Paris school system. Uh, she served on the city council and been the pastor at First Christian Church in Eminence, Kentucky. In addition, she's a published author, and her book, Where Are You, Brother Daniel, uh, is on sale in the church office. We welcome her to our pulpit today. We thank um, uh, Andrea and Mark Underwood for being here early to help set up, and for Greg and Melody Smart for recording the service today and for them uploading it later. We also thank Mike and Andrew Smith who made sure our outdoor worship space was presentable by mowing and trimming uh, and we will be back out there soon. Uh, when we do worship outdoors, we invite you to bring your own lawn chair, uh, sit six feet apart and wear a mask and keep your distance from others. Uh, there are spaces for about 10 cars if you want to drive in and worship from your car. Let us be called to worship. Come and bring heart and soul and mind and energy to this time and place to encounter the living Christ, to seek his wisdom, and to embrace his love. Come be ready for transformation and renewal. Come, prepare to be sent into mission to the world. Come welcome your friends, welcome the stranger. Make time to be open to the Holy Spirit and the peace and joy which comes when the Spirit is present. Come, let us worship the Lord. We gather here Jesus name his love is burning in our hearts like living flames for through the loving son the father makes us one come take the bread come drink the wine come share the Lord no one is a stranger here joins us here he breaks the bread the lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead the one we love the most is now our gracious host come take the bread come drink the wine come share the lord we are now a family of which Though unseen, he meets us 
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today. We ask that you open our eyes so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all these things in your glorious name. Amen. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. Through the woods and forest glades, I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from a lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brooks and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my song. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou As always, I invite you to uh, gather in the names in your life, the names that are important to you, and to rejoice with them and to weep with them, to include them in your prayers. Also, you might want to include events and situations in this life and in this world uh, that uh, need our prayers. We want to pray for Gerald Fields, Sharon Fields' brother, and for Portland, Oregon, where he lives, he said it is, uh, the smoke is so thick, it's, uh, it's dangerous to be out on the streets. There are also um, ongoing uh, demonstrations and rioting there. Uh, we pray uh, for those who are awaiting test results. We pray for Jerry Price, Martha McFarland, his daughter's requesting birthday cards for Jerry. Uh, I think his address is in the newsletter. Um, Mary Adams is having stomach problems. Helen Parsons is in hospice care and is given just a few days to a week. Lisa and Arthur Harrison just became first time grandparents. Trey Harrison and Kelly Bussell are the parents. The baby's name is Sawyer Claire Harrison and an uncle, Ardonna and Emmett Davis. We keep in our prayers the family of Pansy Stewart, aunt of Kim Cox. Her funeral was Friday at Lust McFarland Funeral Home. And Don Hiles with multiple health issues. Let us pray.
Jesus, Jesus, be the Savior we need. Save us from our faults and failures, our mistakes and misstatements, our prejudice and our passive response to critical need. Jesus, Jesus, be our light in the black night of despair, our hope when we cannot see our way back, our strength when we fade in the challenges of daily living. Jesus, Jesus, be our peace amidst consternation and upheaval, in the midst of anger and fear, in the midst of hostility and violence. Jesus, Jesus, stand with those ravaged by fires and those undone by human hatred and injustice. Jesus, Jesus, carpenter, Jesus, stand by the folks on the Gulf Coast who now begin rebuilding their homes and communities after the hurricane. Jesus, Jesus, whose life came up against the political realities and laws of the day, show us how to be civil and good citizens throughout the electoral process this fall. Jesus, Jesus, we are frail and often do not understand. Increase our understanding and strengthen our resolve to know the truth and be set free by it. Jesus, Jesus, receive our love for you as we have received your love to us. We pray, calling out your name, that we might be transformed and renewed on this day. Amen. Tyler. I will read Psalm 32, verse 1 through 11. Blessed is the person whose lawless acts are forgiven. Their sins have been taken away. Blessed is the person whose sin the Lord never counts against them. That person does not want to cheat anyone. When I kept silent about my sin, my body became weak because I groaned all day long, day and night. You punished me. I became weaker and weaker as I do in the heat of the summer. Then I admitted my sin to you. I didn't cover up the wrong I had done. I said, I will admit my lawless acts to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let everyone who is faithful pray to you. While they can still look to you, when troubles come like a flood, they certainly won't reach, reach those who are faithful. You are my hiding place. You will keep me safe from trouble. You're, you will surround me with songs sung by those who praise you because you save your people. I will guide you and teach you the way you should go. I will, I will give you good advice and watch over you with love. Don't be like a horse or a mule. They can't understand anything. They have to be controlled by bits and brittles. If they aren't, they won't come to you. Sinful people have all kinds of trouble, but the Lord's faithful love is all around those who trust in him. Be glad because of what the Lord has done for you. Be joyful. You, you do what is right, seeing all those whose hearts are honest. Good morning. I'm glad that those of you who are here this morning are here. And for those of you who had planned to come to worship this morning, uh, but were deterred because of the rain and uh, the wet ground and things like that, we are happy that you are able to be a part of this service through uh, technology, whatever technology that you have available to you. Uh, for those of you who are home, if you have a Bible, you just heard read Psalm 32, 
And I hope that if you have your Bibles open that you would follow along with us on that today. Let me begin by thanking Pastor Jeff Bell for the opportunity to bring today's message. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to preach uh, to the members and friends of the First Christian Church in Paris, and I'm always delighted to do so when he asks me. This morning, I want you to think for a few minutes about a time not so long ago uh, when most people in Kentucky were farmers. And if you were a farm family or if you grew up near a farm family, uh, you know that most farms raise pigs, hogs. And many of the families who raised hogs uh, raised them for two reasons. One, uh, they would sometimes take the hogs to uh, the stockyard for sale. But many people raised hogs uh, for the primary purpose of feeding their children in the wintertime and their families as a whole in the wintertime. Uh, hog slaughtering time was a, a big business in a community. Neighbors helped neighbors uh, gather in uh, the pigs and they would go through the slaughtering process and not one part of the hog uh, was thrown away. From the head to the tail, uh, human consumption would see that that pig was lived off of all winter long. Now, if you are maybe 45 years and older, or if you have been watching a lot of TV during this pandemic, there is uh, an, a show that you may see now or remember, and it's Green Acres. On Green Acres, two city slickers from New York come to a small town called Hooterville. Uh, they want to be farmers, or rather, the husband wants to be a farmer. And if you have the opportunity to see that show anytime now, you'll see that Oliver is dressed uh, primarily in a tie to go out farming. One of the main characters on that show, who is a resident, was a pig by the name of Arnold. And Arnold had a very, very important role in that TV series. He was supposedly the son of a childless couple from Hooterville, and he was treated very much like a human child. Now, the pig had some human-like qualities at time, and so you see him getting in trouble and getting out of trouble and doing all manner of things that pigs wouldn't ordinarily do. One of the things that surprised me about Arnold as a pig was that he was always clean. If you've ever lived close to a farm that raised pigs, you know they stink. That is the major drawback about pigs. The meat is good, but they stink. There's no other way to say it. They love rooting around in the mud. They stick their noses to the ground, or trying to find something to eat or wallow in, and the odor stays with them forever. And if you are working with pigs, that odor stays with you as well. They stink. But they are happy to be around in a, a mud hole uh, and stick their noses to the ground and eat whatever they can find. They are happiest, it seems, when they are completely filthy. But you and I know in reality, pigs stink. In the text today, which is Psalm 32, the psalmist is aware of his own stink. In other words, he is aware of his own sin. We don't know what that sin is, and he is like uh, Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth. He has sinned greatly, and he can't wash the sin from his hands. He may wear a mask to hide his transgressions. He may change his lifestyle. He may associate with new people and have new friends, but the sin is still there. And no one else may notice that this person has a sin, but he knows. 
And no matter how he looks on the outside or how he feels on the inside, he knows that he is a sinner and that he stinks. Now ask yourself this question. Have you noticed that too often when people sin, they try to deflect their sin onto something or someone else? And they find all kinds of excuses uh, for what they have done. They, 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 they may even say things like, I came from a broken home, my childhood was pitiful, I didn't know any better. And then sometimes you will hear people say, well, the devil made me do it. In their eyes, when they use this type of rationale, everyone is guilty of sin except them. And we who are also sinners from time to time, we, we try to escape our sinfulness by placing them in categories. We'll, we'll say we, we told a little white lie. Or if someone uh, is caught in a situation, they said, well, I just borrowed whatever it is, and I meant to turn, return it, but I forgot. We think that if we haven't committed a big sin, then we are okay. But think about this. When we act in a selfish manner, or we are sinning, and therefore we stink. When we rebel against God and uh, defy the directions that he has given us in the Bible and determine to live our own way, we stink. When we mistreat one another, when we abuse our bodies with drugs and alcohol, we, and when we fail to acknowledge that God is God, need I say it, we stink. We don't have to look in the mirror and no one has to say anything to us about our sins, we can sometimes feel it in our bones that, that our sin is being radiated and that everybody out there and everybody knows that we are a sinner. But one thing about being a Christian is this. We serve a God who loves us so much that he is willing to forgive. The psalm writer says in verse 5 of the text, he said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and he forgives the guilt of my sin. When I read that passage, I said to myself, is he serious? Confessing your sins is tricky. What if someone other than God finds out that I am a sinner? What if I lose my position or my standing in the community? What if my friends or my family turn against me uh, when I confess my sins? What if, what if, what if? What if comes up a lot when you think about confessing your sins? Who in their right mind really wants to confess their sins? In most of our churches, most disciple churches, we don't have a period in our worship services for a time of confession. That doesn't mean that you come forward before the congregation and say, you know, I have sinned this week. It's nothing like that at all, but most of the churches that have a confession time in their worship service, it's a, conf a, a time of prayer that is read in unison. And you admit as individuals and as a congregation that, uh, that you've sinned. But we don't have that in our worship services, not, not often enough. In fact, most Protestant churches don't. But there is an importance that we need to apply to uh, the word confession. We must, from time to time, confess that we are a sinner. And I've seen too many people take that uh, in a jovial way. They say, oh, yes, I am a sinner. But sin keeps us separated from God, and it keeps us separated from each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our one fear in the church today is that uh, our, we, we think that if people find out, they will condemn us. And so a lot of times we say that... Uh, 
I have done, what I have done is nobody's business. It's just between me and the Lord. But in order to better that relationship with God and each other, confession sometimes is a necessary part of who we are as Christians. You remember the story of the prodigal son? Before he had reached the porch of his home, his father came running down to meet him and greet him and cover him with kisses and an embrace. But the young man says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer uh, deserve to be called your son. But that prodigal son scripture lets us know that all was forgiven. Even before he opened his mouth, the very action of returning to God was a confession. Sometimes when we ignore our sins, ignore the time of confession, we become a little off kilter, maybe even a little paranoid or mad like Lady Macbeth, who continued to see blood on her hands and continued to go through the process of wringing her hands and washing her hands when no one else could see the blood on her hands, she saw them. She saw they, that they were red with the blood of people that she and her husband had had killed and betrayed in order for them to be king and queen of the country. What comes next after confession is forgiveness or an assurance of pardon. You know that God forgives, but there is the strong possibility that when you confess your sins to God, uh, man will never let you forget what you have done. Amen? But God's forgiveness is the divine removal of sin. What's so striking about Psalm 32 is that after forgiveness is pronounced, the word, word sin is never used again in that psalm at all. The slate is wiped clean by this act of God, and we encounter some level of peace, some level of joy, and some level of hope. All is forgiven, says God. If we think about it in today's terms, when God forgives, it's like he goes to your personal pigsty and he cleans it up and he cleans you up. Or it's like the lady that you have seen on TV who lives with 40 cats and God goes in and cleans that house up and he takes care of those cats and he takes care of that woman. Our weaknesses and our sins are forgiven by God. Or put it another way, God sees our sin and he hears our cry for forgiveness and he cleans our hearts and gives us another chance at renewal and at having a right relationship again with him. There are some people walking around in the world today who have sinned, who have asked God for forgiveness. God has granted that forgiveness, but they still walk around with that heavy sinfulness on their shoulders, thinking that they can never, ever be forgiven, not by God or anyone else. But God forgives us in order to make life livable again. Just ask King David. When he wrote this psalm, David was rejoicing because he had confessed his sins to God. And God had, forgiving, had forgiven him for the sins he had committed against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. David received divine 
forgiveness. I'm sure there were other people in the court in the country uh, who realized what David had done when he had uh, Uriah killed. But David had the knowledge of knowing that God had forgiven him. And so this morning, the main point that I hope that you will get out of this sermon is that whatever sin you have committed, it doesn't matter if it was this morning or if it was 20 years ago, whatever sin you have committed or whatever sin you have committed by not doing something, the sins of commission, the sins of omission, God is waiting to hear from you. Amen. Sister, let me be your servant, brother, let me As we come around this table remembering our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, I ask two questions. Who are we and who was this Jesus? We are human beings put on this earth that was created by God, the Father of Jesus. We live, we love, we try to advance ourselves. We interact with people of other cultures and beliefs from all over the world. This advancing of our own good and well-being, as opposed to the well-being of all mankind, can produce conflict with people both near us and afar. A reaction to conflict is often to strike out, either verbally or physically. This can escalate to where people are estranged or even physically harmed or killed. These are God's children, just like us. This Son of God, Jesus, whom we profess to believe in and follow, was he ever mistreated and maligned? Yes, by people both close to him and by leaders of the people who should have behaved differently. What did he do? He turned the other cheek. He forgave. He was humble. He was kind. He did not take up arms against those who wronged and persecuted him. While dying upon the cross, he called out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As we gather around this table of forgiveness, at this time of the year when we remember what occurred 19 years ago in our country, may we forgive rather than hate. May we love rather than despise. I'd like to dedicate this song not just to my family here in the States, but to my family in Mexico. Mi corazón te sabe de 
ser santo sea el Señor holy 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 my heart my heart adores you my heart knows how to say to you holy are you lord let's pray dear god as we come to the table today in a world of uncertainties we know for certain what this table means to us we thank you for your plan of salvation we thank jesus for his sacrifice and as we take the emblems we do so in humility and thank you for your grace in jesus name we pray Amen. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Good morning. This week when Jeff asked me to give the benediction, I knew I wanted to share scripture with you guys that was meaningful to me. Well, last night as I was laying in bed and reading my devotional, there it was, the scripture that I wanted to share with you today. So I knew that it was meant to be. So for today's benediction, I'd like to share a verse that has helped me through the past several months, very anxious written months. So may this verse speak to you if you're ever feeling overwhelmed and anxious. It comes from Philippians 4, verses 6, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless you and bring you peace in the days ahead. God bless you and have a wonderful week. 